I'm Eileen Crane, and I'm the founding winemaker at Domain Carneros. I've actually been here 33 years. But I'm also called the chief bubblehead either way. Um, I certainly love uh, sparkling wine, uh, good sparkling wine in all of its guises. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about sparkling wine, about myself, and about um, the wonderful winery of Domain Carneros. I grew up in that great winemaking state, New Jersey. Uh, and it seemed highly unlikely growing up um, in New Jersey that I'd actually end up as a winemaker. I thought if you were going to be a winemaker, you lived in upstate New York and you belonged to an Italian family and you were a guy. Well, I broke the mold. My father had a wine cellar in New Jersey, and he introduced me to Riesling and Pinot Noirs. They were all out of Europe at the time. But one Sunday, he made the mistake, and he opened a bottle of champagne. And he would always let me taste a little bit of whatever was going to be served for Sunday dinner. And I um, tasted my first sip, sip of champagne, and I thought, this is for me. And it a long time through many circuitous routes to find my way to California and into the wine industry. But for 42 years, I have made sparkling wine at three different sparkling houses, and most of it at Domain Carneros. Domain Carneros is the beautiful chateau on the hill between Napa and Sonoma. And I was hired in 1987 to build the chateau. If you come to Napa and Sonoma to visit us, um, you can't miss the Chateau on the Hill on the road between Napa and Sonoma. And we're known far and wide for our fine sparkling wine. Um, and we also, a number of years later, we started to make a little bit of Pinot Noir red wine um, later. But the winery was owned by a family called Champagne Tainter, and they hired me um, to build the winery and get the winery uh, started. And just as I was beginning my uh, job at Domain Carneros, I was sitting in a construction trailer, and Claude Tatinger, the uh, president of Champagne Tatinger at the time, said to me, Eileen, Champagne Tatinger has the finest Blanc de Blanc champagne in all of France. And someday, I want you to have the finest Blanc de Blanc in the United States. And I, you, he heard the gulp on the phone. I was sitting in this trailer. On one side was a dirt moving guy, and the other side was an electrical engineer. And I had uh, no facilities at that time. We were in, a, in the middle of a, a construction pit. But um, I said, well, yes, of course, Mr. Tatinger. He said, no, no, no. He said, we think in terms of um, decades, generations, take your time. So I kind of set that aside for a moment and went about producing our very first cuvee for Domaine Carneros in 1987. I, I borrowed a winery from um, one of my neighbors and made the, our sparkling wine there. But it was the classic boot vintage. And maybe you have seen this wine. Sometimes it has a white label, sometimes a blue label. But th this is the Domaine Carneros classic boot vintage. And it's made up of roughly half Chardonnay and half Pinot Noir grapes, and yet when you pour it in a glass, it's not going to be pink, it's not going to be red. The Pinot Noir, um, when we harvest it, we avoid skin contact, so you can make a very pale colored, um, bubbly, and that's what we've done. We've handled our fruit very, very gently, and the classic um, Domaine Carneros boot, either in the white label or the blue label, are um, my go-to wine on a regular so t move, time moved on a little bit, and we remember that uh, request of Claude Tatinger that he wanted a great Blanc de Blanc from Domaine Carneros. And we did trials on that over uh, four or five years. Little by little, we tried different things. And in um, 91, four years from our first vintage, um, we sent over some samples to Champagne Tatinger and said, what do you think of these? Are, are we getting close to what you would consider a fine Blanc de Blanc? And I immediately received a fax back then. That was the new thing, faxes. Fax back and um, I, he said, 
yes, yes, if the next vintage is equally as good, uh, we'll have our very first super cuvee um, from 100% um, Chardonnay. And then the Rev, which is what it was eventually named, is a wine that we make in very small quantities. Um, and Claude Tainter ordered this specialty bottle for um, the Le Rev, uh, even before he tasted the 92 vintage. So he, he went out and, and sourced this wonderful bottle with the double cartouche of um, ram's heads. And of course, carneros means sheep or ram. If you think about it, um, Chateau Mouton Rothschild, Mouton stands for sheep. And so often, uh, not infrequently, um, the term carneros or mouton show up as um, a part of um, a name in the wine industry. But when we put this wine into the bottle, it was going to lay down and age for about seven years before release. And what we, um, when it was going to be time to release, sorry about the bottle there, um, it was, when it was about time to release the bottle, we thought, what are we going to call this wine? And um, I was sitting in bed with a cup of, cup of tea on a Sunday morning, and I said to my husband, what, did, what should we use? And he said, well, how about Reverie? And he liked that name. I checked it out. Somebody else had trademarked that. So then we came around and we talked and said, how about Rev? That sort of seemed like rubbing, rubbing an engine. It didn't sound quite right. But by little by little, it became the Rev. And the Rev means um, the dream come true. Rev um, in, is French for dream and the Rev. And I've always called it my dream come true wine. And how was that that it became my dream come true? Well, every winemaker who's committed to their job and really wants to make the finest possible, um, wants to find that wine that sort of throws their head back, or the one that says, this is it. And 1989, um, uh, excuse me, 99, we did a big public relations thing at the Chateau. About 10 of the top press people from around the country came to taste the Lorette. Welcoming everybody, chatting with everybody, making sure everybody was happy, um, and then hors d'oeuvres were passed, etc. And I sat down with the group, and before I said anything, I picked up the glass and took a sip, and I thought, what's left? And I tasted the Lorette many times in the laboratory, but this was the first time that I tasted the Lorette in a social situation at a dinner. Uh, tasted it and I thought, this is my epiphany, this is my moment, the Dolor Red. And it's been that way ever since. Although we've made some other ones. Sometimes people say, you only drink Dolor Red, obviously. Oh no, I like all of our sparkling wines. And the Brut, I drink all through the winter, and I always have to have a bottle of uh, bubbles on Friday night. But there's nothing wrong with another bottle of bubble bubbly on Saturday night, Sunday morning in bed. Um, and Monday morning, you make it through to lunchtime, you might need a glass then. So you don't have to wait for special occasions. Um, you open that bottle and there is an occasion. Believe me, if you open the bottle, we think, okay, we forgot to celebrate something, whatever it was, making it through the week. Sometimes that does it. So in the springtime, my palate moves to our rosé. And the rosé, that wasn't one of our first wines to be created. Um, at the time, um, in the 90s, rosés were not very appreciated in the, in the United States. The first thing I think it was because people um, were familiar with cold duck back then or um, white Zinfandel, and they thought it was whatever it was, it was going to be bad. So that little by little, people started to think, well, maybe sparkling rosé could be just so um, we made just a couple of uh, cases of it, just as a little sample, um, and uh, we didn't think we only had it at the winery. You could taste it at the winery. Only for a couple of months could you taste it at the winery. And a couple of gals who worked for our wine distributor in North Carolina 
They said, no, we, we want to buy some to sell in North Carolina. And I said, no, we just have such a tiny bit, we really don't have it. And, um, but little by little, they convinced us, and we shipped a little bit to North Carolina, and they've always been um, a great state for drinking rosé, as far as I can tell. Now, the rosé is an interesting wine. I don't know if you can see this, but it's a, it's a pale pink color, and some part of the of a rosé is the, the color is part of the marker. You've probably seen rosés and there's been so little color that you almost think there's no color. It's almost a white wine. And sometimes you've seen rosé and you think, oh, this is really red. What's that doing in a rosé bottle? But if you can see our um, rosé bottle, you can see that the it's a pale, I think it's peachy or salmon color. Kind of changes with my whim, what I call it. But this beautiful pink um, color is what we aim for. And by the way, this wine, this product is called Cuvée de la Pompadour. And Cuvée de la Pompadour refers to Madame Pompadour. Louis the Fourteenth. Oops, Louis the Fourteenth um, was the Sun King. Louis the Sixteenth got the cold chop, but Louis the Fifteenth got Madame. Madame Pompadour was um, this beautiful woman who became enormously important, important in the court of Versailles. She had a great influence in uh, the arts, um, actually at some points in roles as a uh, major diplomatic person. She also um, made sparkling champagne important in the court of Versailles. Yes, there were champagnes um, for, for centuries, that is, they were wines made in the region of Champagne, but they did not have any bubbles in them. Sparkling Champagne was first invented in England, in London, by a wine merchant, as far as we can tell. Um, and he found that if he added a little sugar to the bottle um, and put a cork in, that the, the bottle would become um, bubbly. And so the first sparkling wines, uh, first sparkling champagnes were actually made champagne, made them sparkly in um, England in the 1660s. There's good records of that. But the French didn't, weren't really excited about what the English were doing to their perfectly nice still wines from champagne. But little by little they caught on to this. They could sell this and they could make money at it. People loved it. Um, and it was popularized in the court of Madame Pompadour and Louis XV, and it's stuck around ever since. But Madame Pompadour, the color of wine, the, the, the wine that she would have called sparkling champagne, um, would have had um, some color to it. She didn't, in, the producer didn't intend it for it to be a pink color. But the reality was that um, they, the way they pressed their grapes, um, they would get more color. So um, we have this very pale pink. It's a sort of a um, peachy color. Um, and that's our marker. And this, our um, uh, rosé, Cuvée de la Pompadour, is made differently than most other rosés. Many, many rosés simply add red wine to the white wine to make it um, pink. We don't do that. We, actually bring in grapes and leave them on skin for a little bit and they pick up some color from the skin. And so it's all done at the same period of time to get that this light color. I don't know if you can see this, but we have tiny, tiny bubbles. Um, and uh, that's one of the markers of Domaine Carneros, returning back to Claude Tatinger. In the early days, Claude Tatinger used to say to me, how do you make those bubbles so tiny? I say, it's my secret. Still have a job 33 years later, um, but we, we make a very different style. I'm not not extremely different. Stateger makes a very elegant style of champagne. We make a very elegant style, but they are our champagne. We are our Carneros, and you can uh, an imi imitation is never as good as an original. So we are clearly an original, um, but people will say, "Oh yes." Um, but we, we're not copy, copycats, but at the same time, um, we, we have our own style. So you might someday want to just sort of taste 
couple of their wines that came to us and our wines side by side and you'll see the differences you'll probably also see um, some similarities those are always fun to, to try side by side the French company versus their um, I call the Ulu sister so this is the um, uh, Cuvée de la Pompadour this is uh, what I sit out on the back deck in the summertime right now it's fun to do that because you can't go any place with little glass of pink bubbles doesn't make any difference you can be having a great time just out there doing that okay so the last bottle, bottle excuse me bottle you think I've been drinking before this well maybe just a little bit um, when um, I was hired and when we got started it was assumed that um, we would be a sparkling house and nothing but a sparkling house and that was fine with me I made sparkling wine for 10 years before I came to the job here and I love making sparkling wine. It's my thing. It's my passion. Well, in 1992, we had more grapes than we needed for our own winemaking. And so we sold a little bit of our uh, Pinot Noir grapes to a uh, rather famous uh, Pinot Noir winemaker in the Carneros. And um, he liked our grapes best. And every year he'd come and he'd want more grapes. And as we were growing up as a winery, fewer grapes to sell. And after Tony came in 1992 and said, you know, I need more grapes, we said, well, we really, you know, we, we, um, he, he was not pleased. But um, after he left, my assistant winemaker at that time looked at me and said, well, he wants those grapes so darn bad. Why don't we just at least make an, ex take an, make an experiment and see what it is? So we made a tiny amount of a red Pinot Noir and put it in a barrel was to give it to the employees as a holiday present. But Claude Tater came to visit us in October, as he did every year, and when he saw that barrel, he said to me, what have you got in that barrel? And I said, well, we have a little Pinot Noir trial, and um, we're, we'll bottle it, we're gonna give it to the employees. And he said, well, can I taste it? When you bottle this wine, please um, ship it over to me and I'll put it in our five-star hotels. At the time, Tate Jer Hope owned a host of um, five-star hotels in Europe. And we did. Of course, you know the employees have never forgiven me that I didn't, um, or that I gave away their wines. On the other hand, we have made it up year after year after year. So I think they didn't lose out. This is our estate Pinot Noir, very beautiful bottle.